I'm going to talk today about combinations of logic learning with probabilistic stuff. And it's, uh, well, the slides are joint work with uh, Angelika Kimmich, with whom I'm given a lot of tutorials on this topic. Um, it's trying to uh, give, um, probabilistic logic learning is trying to give um, an answer to a key question in AI, which is on the one hand, uh, reasoning in about relations or about logic. On the other hand, dealing with uncertainty, and of course also uh, going for learning. Um, and we've seen that in, in different fields. I mean, the logic uh, reasoning comes from KR, the probabilistic reasoning from the UAI community, and the learning, of course, from the machine learning community. Uh, today, I mean, this um, combination is addressed in areas such as statistical relational learning, probabilistic logic programming. Uh, probabilistic programming, is a, programming without logic is also trying to address very similar uh, issues. I'm first going to introduce um, the kind of motivation for this, giving a couple of examples of the kind of things we are trying to do and have done. And then I'm going to go uh, in some details about the basic formalism and uh, going to develop uh, some further ideas. Um, from one perspective, um, our work was motivated by um, a kind of gigantic uh, biological network in which you have like entities as well as relationships amongst them. And if these relationships are kind of, um, kind of probabilistic, um, then you can really, um, you can really use uh, these probabilistic databases or probabilistic logic programs uh, to cope with that. And uh, for instance, if things uh, are crawled from the web, as they are in this BioMind database from uh, my colleague Hanu Toivonen in Helsinki, uh, then it does make sense uh, to talk about uh, the degree of belief um, that you have in uh, particular uh, relations being there or not being there. Um, also, if you look at uh, knowledge graphs, uh, as for instance in the never-ending language learning uh, story uh, that has been developed uh, by William Cohen, Tom Mitchells and others at uh, CMU, uh, you'll basically uh, crawl the web and you'll basically produce a, a large set of facts um, by just using uh, machine learning techniques and, and information retrieval techniques. And what you end up with is a large set of facts together with a kind of certainty factor, which again you can interpret as a kind of uh, degree of belief or a kind of probability, although in practice it isn't. Um, but this is like a prototypical instance of what I would call a probabilistic <coughs> database. Uh, if you look at um, multiplayer online uh, games, then what you will typically see is uh, state descriptions uh, like this one, in which you have like uh, entities which uh, correspond to players, alliances, cities, and other things. And it will also evolve over time. And uh, the question is, can we build probabilistic models that will basically predict what's going to go in the future? And uh, what's typical uh, there is that uh, the number of objects and the relationships that hold amongst them will vary over time. Uh, there will be new alliances created, new players coming in, and stuff like that. Uh, we've also used it, uh, this probabilistic logics to answer uh, probability uh, word problems, um, which are basically concerned with uh, starting from um, a kind of natural language description of a probabilistic exercise, such as the ones that you would find in uh, uh, undergraduate courses. And uh, then the question is, can you come up with the answer? The NLP part, we don't do in this probabilistic logics, but the reasoning part, we do. Uh, it's also part of um, our ERC project in which um, we're doing um, syn synthesis of uh, inductive data models. And the grand vision there is that you start off with a set of Excel tables and you basically try to fill out the gaps. Uh, and there's a lot of underlying stuff that going on. I mean, uh, Andrew was talking about uh, Sumit's work. Uh, we're trying to do some data wrangling. We're trying to build some probabilistic models and we're trying to do a lot more to, to do that basically. We're trying also to, to, do, to learn the learning task in a sense. But I guess a common theme in all of these is that, um, well, you've got um, this SRL framework. You reason about relational uh, data. There is entities and relationships. There is uncertainty and you want to do uh, learning. And I should stress that in this area, it has been very productive since the early 90s. Um, there's a lot of different formalisms and uh, if you look at the history of this, uh, well, um, there's basically many, many different formalisms uh, that have been devised over uh, the different years. Uh, too many to sum up and they're still evolving. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus in on the one that we've uh, been working on and that's basically within a probabilistic programming, a probabilistic database and the logic programming framework. It's basically encompassing uh, all of these. 
Uh, if you want to get a more detailed introduction, I would refer to uh, these two booklets, uh, basically. But probabilistic logic programs, uh, they go back to about 25 years ago when they were first devised by David Poole uh, in the early 90s, and then Sato developed a kind of formal semantics and also a first learning algorithm for this. It basically starts from the, pro the programming language Prolog, and it adds, uh, in a very simple way, uh, random variables. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll go into detail about that. About that. Uh, you can view them as directly upgrading graphical models, and I'll also show that things like plates you can directly map uh, to uh, these probabilistic logics. And as such, they combine uh, the expressive power on the one hand of a Turing machine, uh, because of course Prolog is Turing equivalent, and uh, on the other hand of graphical models. Um, and it's also kind of uh, a generalization of the probabilistic database uh, formalism. Uh, there is many different implementations of this, uh, these frameworks, and I'm going to take the liberty to focus on the one that we developed in Leuven over the past uh, 10 years. And I'm going to go uh, in a number of different steps. I'm going to talk about modeling. How do you model with these languages? Um, what does it mean? Um, then how to do inference. A bit of learning, a bit of dynamics, and a bit of uh, decision theoretic extensions, basically. Um, so if you look at uh, Problog, uh, just a probabilistic prologue, and so what it actually... Uh, uh, boils down to is that um, you start from, well, in a normal um, kind of logical and relational representation, you would use prolog and you would have a set of facts together with a set of rules that allow you to infer further facts. Um, what is changing in that is that if you go to problog or if you go to probabilistic databases, uh, what is basically changed is that the facts which are uh, deterministic in Prolog, they're either true or false, become now true or false with a particular probability. And these are the primitive random variables that we will work with. And this is all you need to define uh, kind of probabilistic languages to subsume most of what uh, graphical models do, uh, directed graphical models do, uh, and so on, basically. Uh, there is then also like learning. Uh, you can conceive learning at two different levels. You can learn the parameters, or you can learn also the structure, which means that you would learn the rules of the game, basically. Let me illustrate this on a simple example. Um, it's uh, about playing a game, and uh, you see there is like two urns. In each of the urns, there are balls that are colored. There's also a coin, and uh, the purpose of the game is that you toss um, the biased coin, and you draw a ball from each of the urns. Uh, then you win the game. If, um, well, the coin comes up heads and there is a red ball, or you draw two balls of the same color. The question is now, how can we model this in uh, this probabilistic uh, prolog? And uh, the first thing to see is that, okay, there are these random variables. And, um, well, these random variables, they are turned into probabilistic facts. So you've got, like, the fact heads, and it's a biased coin. It comes up with probability 40% heads, with probability 60% well, head's going to be false and it's not going to be in your model. Then you have like what we call annotated disjunctions, sometimes called also switches or choice points. Uh, and the, cho the, the AD corresponding to uh, the first urn is the one listed here. Uh, with probability 30%, if you draw from the first urn, you're going to end up with red. Probability 70%, you're going to draw a blue ball. Um, and then the same for uh, the second urn, where you've got three possible uh, colors. And of course, uh, you see also the, uh, the probabilities of, these, um, of, these, of the, the corresponding colors. Uh, this is what is called the annotated disjunctions, the choice points. And all what you then need to do is uh, add the rules of the game uh, and code them as just a logic program uh, on top of that. And so this rule would say, well, you win if heads comes up, or uh, there is at least one red ball, you don't care which uh, ball is red, it could be the first or it could be the second, you're really indifferent to that. And you also win the game uh, if the color of the first urn is C, and that is the same color of the second ball, basically. Um, so to summarize, uh, these programs, they have probabilistic choices, um, which constitute the basic random variables. I mean, they basically unify um, I mean, the elementary unification of probability and logic that is happening here is that you take the most primitive thing in 
probabilities here, which is a random variable, and you take the most primitive thing in logic, which is just a kind of pro, um, atom, a kind of atomic expression uh, like you see here, and you, you unify them. Uh, on top of that, you encode consequences in the kind of rules that uh, Prolog and Logic provide you. Uh, what you can then do is you can ask all the kind of questions that you would typically want to ask to uh, a graphical model. Uh, you can ask for the probability that you win, uh, the marginal probability. You can ask for a conditional probability. What's the probability that I'm going to win the game if I observe or know that the second ball is green? And what's the most likely world in which something is going to be true? In order to understand what this means, um, it's kind of convenient to view this as a generative model. I mean, these programs, they generate possible worlds. And um, as such, um, it's a generative model. And uh, let's see how this goes. I mean, initially we start off with the empty possible world, and then we will go through all the possible choices um, that we can make, and uh, take one of the choices, and we'll obtain a possible world. So first there is heads. And OK, let's sample and assume it comes up heads. Then we add that to our possible world with probability 40%. Um, we look at the second one. Uh, again, we, take, um, we sample from these two colors. And with probability 30%, we're going to get red. We go through the third um, probabilistic choice. And we sample <coughs> green. And at that point, we've basically sampled all our uh, basic random variables. And we also know the probability with which this is going to be the case, namely the product uh, that you see over there. All what remains to be done then is to reason forward, uh, to reason about all the implications of these basic random facts together with our rules that we have. And in this case, we see that uh, the rules are satisfied. I mean, there is like a head and a red ball, and so we will add win to this, basically. Uh, and you can do that for the other um, possibilities uh, in a very systematic way. I mean, here you see in the second case what uh, happens if heads doesn't come up, and you draw two times the red ball. Again, you're going to have to add uh, win to that, and here you see another possibility. If you generate all the possible worlds uh, for this little toy example, you'll end up with these 12 uh, possibilities. And now we basically have our basic uh, possible world on which we can uh, reason uh, about probabilities. We can now answer the question, what's the most likely world in which winning is true? And if you go through all the possible worlds, you'll see that it's the last one uh, having the highest probability. Uh, you can also look at the marginal probability uh, of winning being true. Uh, in order to find that, you look at all the worlds where win holds, and you basically sum up their uh, weight, you sum up their probabilities, and you'll end up uh, with 0.56% uh, uh, if we did the calculations right. And um, then you can, of course, also do the conditional probabilities, um, which, well, you do by applying the definition of conditional probability and then looking at the two kind of um, values that you will have. You will get um, the uh, orange um, divided by uh, the sum of the blues, basically, and that will be the probability that you win given that uh, the color of the second ball is green because well, the blue are the ones uh, where the second ball is indeed uh, green, basically. Uh, you can define all of that very formal. I'm going to be pretty informal in this talk, uh, because otherwise it will lead too far. But um, basically what you get is that, um, well, here is like this probability of these basic random variables of the possible choices that you make. You get the probability that something is true uh, here. Well, for those things that are not true, you get 1 minus the probability of the kind of random variable. And then to decide whether uh, what the probability of a query is, you look at the probability that that query is, in, is entailed by the basic facts that you have uh, in your uh, possible worlds together with uh, the rules. Um, I, I want to stress here that it's very easy uh, to encode standard directed graphical models uh, in this framework. Uh, here is a simple plate model uh, that is probably familiar to most of you, uh, where you've got students, you've got also courses, and then, well, for every student there is the intelligence factor, and there is, for every course, there is the difficulty of the course, and the two together will influence the grade that the student gets 
uh, on these courses. And um, so, um, well, that's standard um, plate models, I would say, and you can easily encode that uh, in Problog. Uh, the way to do this would be, um, well, first of all, for every student, you would have like this <coughs> random variable uh, intelligence and here it said that 40% of the students, or with probability 40%, he would be intelligent. Uh, with probability 50%, the course is difficult uh, for every course that you possibly have. Then you list all the students, you list all the courses, and then we still need to encode uh, the kind of derived relationships. And we're going to do that by using these annotated disjunctions. Uh, for instance, um, well, intelligence and difficulty, they can both have the values true and false. So there's four possible combinations in a kind of conditional probability table for a grade. And so we're going to have four possible rules for that. The first one is if the student is intelligent and not difficult, well, with probability 1%, 100%, he's going to get uh, an A in that case. That is what the rule says. Um, and then the second one basically says if the course is difficult, and the student is intelligent, then there's only 30% probability of grade A, 50 of grade B, and 20% of grade C, basically. You can uh, take, you can also look at the other possibilities um, <coughs> where what happens if, well, the student is not intelligent and the course is not difficult, and so on, basically. But that's the basic uh, direct translation of this plate model into uh, probabilistic. Uh, logics. The nice thing about this is that it's very convenient um, to now extend it uh, and inject further background knowledge, logical background knowledge. You can, for instance, um, inject um, conditions saying that, okay, a student will get an unsatisfactory grade overall um, if, uh, well, one of his grades is basically uh, a failure in F. Uh, and you can then also put some requirements uh, for uh, an excellent uh, great, namely that, well, he needs to have uh, an, an A, basically, and uh, there should not be, um, should not be grades uh, between, uh, there should not be grades uh, that are below uh, an A. And so you can use the logic to encode further uh, derived uh, relationships. Um, further things you can do in these logics quite elegantly and quite easily is encode like things like Markov models over time and I'm very interested in dynamic models. Um, for instance here you've got um, a model in which uh, it can either rain or um, the sun can shine and it's a dynamic model. So initially there's a 50-50 uh, between the two possible choices. Um, and then you can look at what happens uh, if um, you're in the state where uh, it's sunny, basically. Let me go a bit further. Um, so here, if the previous state is sunny, then you get a probability of 60% that the next state is also going to be sunny and 40% uh, of the other case. And you see also for uh, the rainy case that you can encode this quite neatly. Uh, all of this is well-defined. There is well-defined semantics due to Sato and, and Poole uh, that basically, um, well, even though these worlds are infinite, uh, in practice, if you want to answer queries, you only need to look at uh, a finite subset uh, of them. Uh, relationship to other models, uh, in particular, I want to stress here that uh, these probabilistic logics uh, they just have as a special case probabilistic database, and there has indeed been a lot of interest uh, in the database community in working with probabilistic databases. Uh, people like Dan Suchu uh, have actually uh, done a lot of pioneering work on efficient uh, an uh, an query answering there. Um, and again, it's, it's very similar. I mean, in a normal database, you would have a set of relations. You would get a query in something like SQL. And uh, what is changing is now that, um, well, every tuple in your database is also getting a particular probability. And other than that, um, the core IDs are essentially the same. So probabilistic logic programs are just an extension of that ID uh, to programming languages, uh, if you like. Uh, and that is also what is uh, happening uh, and can be used uh, in this kind of uh, knowledge graphs 
in a kind of probabilistic databases. So to summarize uh, the key ideas, um, there's probabilistic choices in here. Uh, that's the basic random variables that you have. That's the one that define the probability of a possible world. And then there is the consequences which are encoded uh, by the different rules. And then, of course, you can uh, consider all kinds of questions about this. If people are interested in playing, I would refer to our website. There is a kind of interactive tutorial uh, with which you can plug and play and uh, produce your own programs and, and try them out. Um, the second part is uh, showing a little bit uh, of how to do inference uh, for these logics. And uh, inference is quite uh, hard. Uh, it's actually sharply complete. Um, and the reason is, of course, uh, what is known as the disjoint sum problem. Uh, if you look at this simple program where you've got three coins, uh, each with different probabilities, and where you win the game if the first comes up heads or the second answer it come up heads, um, then it's easy to see that, um, well, you'll win the game if and only if. I mean, I'm squeezing some logic programming theory under the hood here, but you can basically consider that you win the game if and only if this expression is going to be true. And so it's kind of tempting to write that the probability of win is the probability of this kind of expression. But of course, given that you've got an or here, it's not legal uh, to just uh, take the sum of these two uh, probabilities independently. I mean, you know that the sum of the union uh, should take into account also the intersection and it should subtract it. Uh, of course, if you have just like two of these, a disjunction of two kind of conjunctions, it's still relatively easy. Uh, but in practice, well, it really blows up and you get uh, to do a lot of machinery uh, to cope uh, with these uh, problems. Um, this is also where most of the work in the past decade has gone into. Uh, in the initial attempts by people like Norbert Fuhr, uh, things have, um, well, been very, very limited. I think by now there is a, a speed up of at least three factors of magnitude, three orders of magnitude um, that have come along and that's by a combination of progress in both the logic programming community, basically answer set programming techniques, um, and also uh, weighted model counting. And so the way that Problock works today is uh, basically that you'll map the uh, inference problem onto a weighted model counting problem. And uh, the way to do that is you first ground it out and uh, you put the formula in a kind of CNF format. Uh, here you see what happens. I mean, it is, it is already grounded. And so you rewrite that into a conjunctive normal form um, and then you add uh, weights. The weights are corresponding to the probabilities. You get weights for the heads. Uh, well, you get weights for the positive literals uh, that are here. And then the weight for the negative literal is basically one minus that for uh, the positive ones. And these weights are only added for your probabilistic choices. They're not added for the rules, basically. Um, the uh, weight for uh, win is going to be uh, one and for not win, it's also going to be one. And so that problem can be mapped onto weighted model counting. Uh, what you do in weighted model counting is basically you've got a logical uh, formula and then you're going to take the sum over all possible interpretations. Well, the interpretations, they're just the uh, assignments of truth values to these uh, propositional variables. And uh, in one such interpretation, you take the product of all the weights in there, basically. Uh, there's a close resemblance with uh, what is happening in, uh, in the SAT community um, and that also kind of explains why this is Sharpie complete. Um, I mean, in SAT you're looking for one model that satisfies uh, the theory. Here you're basically counting how many models there are and what you do here is you just take into account weights, basically. Uh, again, there has been a lot of progress in these uh, weighted model counters. Uh, a lot of progress uh, has been made um, by connecting this uh, to an area which is called uh, knowledge uh, compilation. Um, and in knowledge compilation, what you do is you will map these formulas into a kind of data structure like uh, an OBDD, uh, which is the most basic uh, of these uh, representations. Um, and they naturally disjoin 
um, the kind of uh, sums that you have to make. Uh, there's a whole series of uh, works on data structures. Uh, well, we started off 10 years ago with uh, BDDs, then we went on to what is known as SD NNFs, and now we're with SDDs, uh, which is kind of the next generation. And all of these uh, produce speedups of, again, uh, an order of magnitude. Uh, what this BDD is mentioning is like, well, it's mentioning all the elements uh, in the theory. Um, and it's, you can view it as a kind of decision graph. Um, whereas in one branch, you take uh, the true branch, the other, uh, the, uh, the false branch. And at every level in the tree, you're going to have the same um, variable. And then if it ends up in a one, well, y y winning is going to be true. And uh, if it ends up in a zero, it's going to be false, basically. I should stress that there is a lot of different variations. Given the hardness of the problem, uh, people have developed a lot of different uh, approximate inference uh, techniques, both at the level of weighted model counting and at the level of the logical inference itself. Um, the kind of grand challenge for the field is to do what is called lifted inference. Um, and here you see like uh, one rule that uh, illustrates this. Um, a, a person is infected if he has contacts with another person that is sick. Um, and of course the probability of the person being infected is going to depend on the number of contacts with sick people uh, he basically had. And so if you take the grounding approach, uh, which I just described, you're going to ground it out and if you've got a million people in your database, you're going to end up with uh, an enormous uh, uh, database and an enormous theory and you're not going to be able to do anything. But the grand challenge is to do like you would do in, in, in logic programming, uh, to use something, some, some kind of resolution, uh, theory improving equivalent for probabilistic reasoning and to make the inference uh, by just counting uh, the number of y's basically. And that's the grand challenge uh, that people like Dan Suchu, also people like Guy van den Broek, former student of mine, have uh, been tackling and uh, have also had uh, steady progress uh, on these issues. Also, David Poole has uh, actually put that uh, problem on the scientific uh, agenda. And that's um, kind of pretty technical uh, problems. And there's like um, proves what you can lift and proves what you cannot lift under certain conditions, um, both in databases and in SRL, basically. Uh, you can also do learning. Learning is not that different than what you do in standard graphical models. Um, if you have a, a theory like that, you can learn the parameters. Um, and, uh, well, you can learn that it's quite easy to learn these parameters if your data is full possible walls, uh, because then what it boils down to is, as usual, is a kind of maximum likelihood uh, counting. I mean, if you want to uh, estimate uh, one of these values, uh, one of these facts. Um, you're just going to count in uh, how many of the uh, possible walls it, that you've observed uh, it occurs, and you're going to divide by the number of, poss of possible interpretations, the number of examples uh, that you have. You can also learn from partial interpretations, and this is very much like learning from partial uh, data in uh, Bayesian networks. Uh, also there, what you will do is typically use a kind of EM mechanism uh, to first predict how likely it is that the missing things occur uh, in a possible world. And then, um, yeah, you, you're going to use that to do the counting and you're going to iterate, basically. Learning is also about structure learning. And here it's interesting to observe that the old techniques from uh, inductive logic programming and relational learning, you can also scale them up, you can also uh, lift them in a sense, upgrade them uh, to work with these probabilistic logics. And uh, we've been doing some work along these lines uh, in the context of this uh, knowledge graphs, um, where also people like uh, William Cohen at uh, CMU have uh, learned rules uh, in different logics, uh, they've used this Pro PPR, uh, they've also got a new system that ties into neural networks, um, where you basically want to learn rules um, on the basis uh, of data. But um, what we did is basically take the standard, uh, well, the simplest possible uh, rule learner in uh, for log inductive logic programming, which is FOIL, and we've lifted that uh, to our probabilistic uh, logic programming language. 
Um, to give a very tiny toy example, uh, what you would get in uh, a typical inductive logic programming setting is, well, you would get examples uh, like this, uh, and then maybe there is um, the instance you want to go whether uh, the weather is okay for surfing, um, and um, it will depend on the, the probability of precipitation, which is this one, uh, whether the wind is okay and whether the sun will shine. But of course, if you're going to do that, like, uh, not today, but tomorrow, uh, all of these are going to be uncertain. And that's going to be the motivation, in a sense, to go for the uh, problog version uh, of the setting. Uh, what you would do in inductive logic programming is starting from facts like these. You would obtain rules, uh, like indicated here, that given an example would say, well, does that example follow from these rules and what I know about uh, the examples uh, in my database. Uh, so whether B, well, that's uh, what is in my database, H is the set of rules, whether or not that entails uh, the logical example. What we do in um, this PropFoil system is we basically replace <coughs> Prolog by Problog, and we do very similar things. Uh, our examples are now probabilistic, uh, and also our database is probabilistic, and we learn uh, rules uh, of that, that type in a very, very similar manner. There's some interesting things you can say about uh, examples and about like um, probability of uh, being covered. In a normal setting, it's either fully covered or not covered. Now, if you predict a probability of 70%, for a particular example, um, and you know that your target was supposed to be 50%, well then you know that there is a, a discrepancy between uh, the target and uh, what you wanted to predict. And you can actually uh, lift things like um, um, true positives, false negatives, and all of that to um, a kind of, of, of uh, to the setting and you can very easily lift then um, the standard rule learning algorithm uh, to work uh, with this kind of setting. Um, we've done stuff on these knowledge graphs. Uh, in, we've taken subsets, relatively small subsets, of uh, NEL and basically uh, learned rules for that. And there it shows that if you work with the probabilistic setting, uh, you get better results, you get better accuracy uh, than if you ignore the probabilities, which is what uh, people have been doing uh, for a long time in the um, knowledge graphs, um, at least the one in, um, in, in CMU, basically. Um, the next thing I want to briefly talk about is dynamics. I was already talking about this kind of dynamic games. Um, and it's kind of very convenient uh, to reason about uh, such games, again, in a rule-based manner. Um, here you've got a particular state, and if you're in these games, you want to predict what's going to happen in the future. And so it does make sense to look at rules um, and to take the conditions of the rules for now and predict what's going to happen in the next step. So given that these conditions hold, uh, in the next step, uh, so given that now, well, the city is... Uh, owner is this, another city is under attack, the two cities are close to one another, then it might be that in the next time step, um, the city uh, that was under attack is being conquered uh, by this attacker and changes actually uh, owner. Um, and what you want to do in these cases is again use rules like that uh, to predict what's going to happen uh, in the future. Um, very similar things. We've been, um, and extensions of that is what we've been developing um, for robotic settings, uh, simple robotic settings. Um, but in robotics, you need to, to cope with numbers uh, and real numbers because everything is like uh, in terms of distances and in terms of sizes. And um, so there is an extension that we developed uh, on this um, distribution semantics by Poole and Sato that works with uh, real distributions. Uh, with continuous distributions, and here, for instance, the first rule states that if the type of object is a glass, then the length of that object will be Gaussian distributed with a particular uh, standard deviation. Um, and then you can, uh, again, view this as a generative process. If you take a particular glass, you can sample from that distribution in order to get the length of that object, and that will go in the possible world. Once you've got these uh, sampled 
uh, distributions, uh, well, this, the sampled uh, random variables, you can again use that to reason about it. For instance, uh, in situations like that, you want to say that two objects are stackable on top of one another if the length of the bottom object is uh, larger than the length of the top object and the width uh, is uh, also uh, holding like that. And so you can reason with that. Um, you can do uh, some kind of cool things with that. Um, let me just mention that you can look on, on the web if you're interested in these uh, smaller examples. Uh, but for instance, uh, what Davide Nitti, uh, a former student of mine, has done is he's re really looked at um, kind of complicated scenarios where you work with boxes and uh, you put one box inside the other and then you start moving them around and uh, the question is where is the box uh, remaining and using a, a particle filter on top of uh, this uh, DC formalism uh, you can keep track uh, of these uh, things. Um, we've also used that in uh, more serious robotic settings, which are still admittedly simple, um, where the task is basically to configure objects on a shelf. Um, and uh, in order to configure objects on a shelf, maybe you need to do more than one action. Uh, so you maybe need to uh, look a little bit ahead. Uh, for instance, uh, in order to um, to, well, to put that object in there, maybe you first need to tap another object aside, and so you need uh, a few steps, a few actions uh, to really do that. Um, and we've learned what we call affordances. Affordances are kind of um, strips-like representations, but they involve like continuous distributions. And basically on the basis of um, a few tryouts, uh, kind of babbling phase, um, by, in which the robot will basically uh, do certain actions in certain situations, what you can do is you can like learn general rules that will predict uh, the delta between uh, before the action and after the action. And this you can then use uh, later on, um, later on basically uh, to do a little bit of planning. Uh, and here you see, well, another, we've done it with real robots and with a lot of simulators. Um, real robots we've used is this arm and uh, also uh, the ICOP, which, of which you saw the simulation just uh, a couple of, of slides back. Um, and so with these representations, they're very expressive. Uh, the kind of relational MDPs also coping with continuous distributions. And so you can also try to plan with that. Once you've got the actions in there, you can see what their effects are going to be. And you can uh, take certain goals and try to plan to make it happen under uncertainty, coping with uh, both discrete and continuous uh, representations. Um, how much time do I have? Two minutes. Two minutes, okay. Just enough time to also talk about the last part, uh, which is a kind of decision theoretic extension of this um, in social networks. Uh, you might want to do some viral marketing. Um, well, there is donuts that you want to sell. If you sell one, you earn five uh, dollars. I should say five pounds here. Uh, but if you uh, send, send some kind of advertisement to one of your people in the network, uh, well, that costs, uh, in this case, uh, three dollars. And the question that you may have here is um, what uh, people should you target in your network? And uh, that will, of course, depend on the relationships between uh, the people in the network and also in how, well, the friends are influenced if you buy something. And uh, we've developed a variant called uh, DT Problog, um, where you basically induce, well, for every person, uh, here you say, I have this marketed uh, predicate, and that's my decision fact. Uh, the purpose of, of um, this problem is to decide which persons I should market. And so you have to decide there, is it going to be true or false? Then you've got a normal problem program in which you say that, okay, if X is the friend of Y, then the probability that X will buy uh, and by trusting the other guy is 30%. Um, and so if your friend buys it, and um, then you will buy it with probability 30%. Uh, and if you're marketed, the probability is only, if you're the target of marketing, the probability that you will buy is only 20%. 
Um, then in decision theory, you also need utilities. I mean, that's the plus five or minus three uh, from the start. And again, you can see that, um, well, you can go for some very similar kind of generative process where now this marketed fact, these decision facts uh, are also in there. Once the decision facts are in there, you can look at uh, the expected uh, utility. And the question is, of course, here, um, how do I maximize uh, the expected uh, utility uh, in this particular setting? Um, this is a setting that's also pretty practical. Uh, we've applied that in biology, uh, where there is like uh, biological interaction networks. Um, and uh, the idea is that uh, from the interaction networks and some data about uh, the, the problem, uh, about omics, uh, we basically turn that into a probabilistic network. And then the idea is that uh, you want to identify which links in the network are important to explain this kind of uh, phenomena. And there's been a number of papers about this in um, yeah, some biological uh, journals. I'm at the end of the talk. Uh, I should stress there is more applications. Uh, people have looked at medical reasoning. Uh, people have looked also at activity recognition um, and, and, and many more uh, things, basically. Um, to summarize, um, I've looked at combining logic with probability and with learning, and um, in a particular way by taking a logic programming framework combined with uh, directed graphical models. If people are interested in further reading uh, about logic and learning, I'd recommend my old book. And uh, if people are interested in the probabilistic variations, I'd refer to the new book with uh, Christian, Sriram, and David. And uh, there's also kind of uh, a pretty dense uh, survey paper in Machine Learning Journal uh, of, of 15. Um, let me thank all my collaborators. The most important ones are in, in, for this talk are in, in bold. And uh, let me also mention uh, a lot of other systems that are available uh, in this area. Thank you.